What I've got for you today is supposed to be an amazing match of StarCraft 2. It's time for a best of three series that was played during the ESL Open Cup. A Terran versus Zerg. We're in game number one in the top left -hand corner. We have none other than Shin going for what seems to be a 15 hatch. He, have the, he had that gas around for a little bit. I thought for a second he was going to keep it, but that would be kind of wild. His opponent in the opposite corner playing with the red Terran pieces. He goes by the name of Gumiho. The Tal Terran himself. The Gumi God. The Tal Terran, by the way, has rubbed off on other Terran players around the world as well. Once upon a time, Gumiho was the only Terran who would actually play with a little towel over his mouth's hand. Because apparently he's got some sort of excessive sweating from the hands. But these days, even players like Maru have like a little towel. Not, not quite as big as Gumiho's towel, but I know that, for example, Maru also plays with a little hand fan. He has like a little USB hand fan that he's got pointed at his mouse hand. Anyways, no Maru in this particular game. It's going to be a standard wall off right here on the high ground. Gumiho not messing around with the low ground stuff at the moment. He has been a big fan of that overall. 15 hatch into a 15 overlord into what seems to be a 15 supply spawning pool as well. This has, of course, become a very popular strategy. Although, I feel like it's lost a bit of popularity on some maps. A lot of pro gamers no longer really enjoy going for the 15 hatch that frequently, but... Of course, still a strong strategy all around. I always wonder exactly how you control the towel, though. Because I know some players, like, wrap the towel around their hand, and then they put their hand on the mouse. Because the problem is if you just put the... Say you have the mouse at the bottom, then the towel, then your hand on top, right? To try and deal with the sweat. There's a chance that your towel is gonna get stuck underneath the mouse. And if that was me, that would definitely happen while I'm trying to spread my marines and all that, so... There is some towel micro involved as well. Not easily done. Anyways, this overlord is gonna hide on top of the pillar. And we're even going to send the barracks. Ooh, SCV going around and trying to sneak away. This is expensive, though. The problem right here for Gumi is that, yeah, he's gonna get the Overlord 100% of the time. But at the same time, he's also not gonna be able to get the Reactor. Oh, no. Oh, Shin. Shin's still playing with the D.Va announcer. He could have played with any announcer, even the Loco announcer. He decides to go with the D.Va one. You're all out of minerals, but there's plenty of rocks. That is my most disliked voice line in the entire game. I really tried playing with the D.Va announcer just for the memes, but at some point, guys in the chat did not like it anymore. <laughs> it's actually a crazy voice line too, because the worst thing about it, I tested this. If you mine out the entire mineral lines, right? Like all of the minerals on the entire map, all of the mineral lines in the entire game, she will still say, you're all out of minerals, but there's plenty of rocks, which just does not make any sense. Anyways, what exactly are we going for here? It's a tech lab on the factory after one Hellion. Three Marines, one Hellion, bunker at the front? Ooh, what are you doing here? Ah! There's a fusion core coming. Now this is an old school build and maybe the reason why this series was recommended to me. I haven't seen a whole lot of Battlecruiser play as of late. But it looks like the Gumi God himself is gonna try and mix it up a little bit. This is one of those builds that really has lost popularity over the last two years or so. Mostly because, well, the Battlecruiser is not considered to be that great of a unit. But overall, Zerg players also have gotten much better at dealing with it. It's a massive commitment. You need to justify going for the biggest and baddest unit in the entire game. Other than maybe the Mothership. Uh, actually, that's not really the case anymore. Now that I think of it, the Mothership these days is 300 minerals, 300 gas. Battlecruisers are 400 minerals, 300 gas. Plus basically a supply depot each. Very expensive, there it is. It could have technically also been Liberator ranged, but then he should have already started producing Liberators. That's an even less common strategy. The Liberator ranged opener, it's actually very strong. It's just one of those things that you rarely see, and because of that, it can be quite strong, but... All right, the good old battle cruiser. Barracks on the back of it, so we'll have to see how many of these he's gonna make. The weapon refit is also researching. That is the Yamato cannon upgrade for the battle cruiser, which usually is an indicator that we're gonna see at least two. 
Usually, at least back in the day, uh, that would mean three. So you would, at least when this build was more popular, you would go either one or three. Or I guess Mass Battle Cruiser. I'd be very surprised if this is Mass BC. But it definitely is going to be multiples. It doesn't really make sense to make one Battle Cruiser and then also invest all this money. Because this is a lot of tech caught up in, well, what is just going to be a singular unit here in just a moment. Shin has no idea what he's playing against, by the way. So he's decided to go for a normal build. So that's a regular timing on the lair. Bingling nest coming up. He's going to be able to get the bingling speed. Lair is actually a little late. He's prepared against a bunch of stuff. Like, for example, benchies and liberators and all that. But Battle Cruiser number one already teleported towards the top left and corner. Gumiho tried to see if maybe he could hide it. But he decides to, yeah, dash it in. Second BC, though, coming up. So the Queens did get a few nerfs, of course, over the years, but they still have a lot of range. And if it's just Battle Cruisers without Hellions or anything along those lines, I don't think I love it that much. He's actually target firing drones here. <laughs> so there is going to be a follow up with 1 1 and Stimpak and all that, but when all the Queens can be dedicated to base defense, and there's no Hellion attempt on the left side, for example, right over here, I don't know if I love the. Singular BC for now. Maybe the follow-up with Marines is gonna be a little bit stronger. Although I say that, this is really not good though. Oh, great catch right there by Shin. Gets all of those Marines easy peasy. And now suddenly, Gumio is finding himself in a really tricky position. Rather than using the second battle cruiser for base defense, he decides to jump that one across the map as well. Queens are running on over in this direction. At least some of them. There's still four in the main base. Third base for the Terran, though, does get the Knight. Okay, we will have a Yamato Cannon on the High Energy Queen. Brenda is no more. Everybody rejoice. Problem is, this is all on a timer. As soon as the Spire finishes up, Corruptors are likely going to be the name of the game. But honestly, he could even decide to go for Mutas in this instance. If he kills this Battle Cruiser, oh no. Oh no, I think he gets it. Eh? Maybe? Maybe not. Nah, it's gonna be Corruptors. Shin does not really want to take any chances, which is fair enough. But these two battle cruisers, have they really paid for themselves? This bad boy has got 10 confirmed kills. Obviously, you can still jump them back home as well, but it takes about a second before it activates. Actually, I think it takes exactly a second before it activates. So, Guiho should definitely be careful. Tactical jump is available. Has he seen the Spire? I would imagine not. No. Corruptors at this point are out. We need to see the uh, Insta Blink. Big Zorkling run by in the meantime on the other side of the map. I quite like that move. That may just draw the eyes of Gumiho away. That's a dead battle cruiser. And I guess this guy. Don't fly to your death, dude. Just go home. No. No. Gumi. 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 Oh. All right. That was not worth that overlord. But he did get it. And he is going to be able to repair this bad boy back up to full health. Okay. So. Now that the dust has settled, how good is this situation right here for Shin? It's certainly an advantage, but this is a difficult map to capitalize on it. Generally speaking, Golden Aura considered to be quite good for the Terran. Oh, lower the depot, Gumi. Hello. Tao got in the way. We decided not to lower the depot and we just give up on that tech lab, apparently. Oh, he already got what he needed. Combat shields and stim pack. All of it is done. Push towards the left side of the map. Gumiho taking a chance here, hoping that this is... Really? Okay. Hoping that this is where that base is gonna come up. Turns out the fourth hatchery was built all the way on the right side of the map. There was still room in the plane. But he knew that the Corruptors were coming, and apparently not everybody, uh, yeah, scooted over. So one of the Metavex is entirely empty. Fourth Hatchery is building up north, which... is why Shin is actually still in a pretty good position. He's now all the way up to 89 workers. That's the fifth base, by the way, not the fourth. Tactical Jump is available. Yep, we decided to fly that one all the way across the map by itself. So at least it'll be able to harass a little bit later on into the game. 
The main problem right here is that Gumiho doesn't really have a lot of tempo going for him, right? So he can still go for like a big parade push. I don't think that would be a bad choice. Like for example, when 2-2 is done, try to go for what is essentially going to be an all-in. Or you have to play very defensively. He's adding on two factories. The Gumi God is thinking about going Terran Mech. Either that or we just want to make a lot of Widow Mines. Either that or he thought he already added on a second factory and then he decided nope. And he accidentally made a third. <laughs> Anyways, Tech Lab coming up over here, Reactor coming up over there. So Widow Mines and Siege Tanks is gonna be the name of the game it looks like. 2-2 is finishing though. And this would be a good opportunity for the Terran to go for a push. But it needs to be very cautious. Like, despite the fact that he's close to maxing out, it is very easy to overextend. Like, there's no tempo here for the Terran whatsoever. And Chin has been allowed to do whatever he likes. Now, what exactly does he like? He's decided to go up towards a Hive. Ultralisk Cavern here. Which is really quite good against just, well, Siege Tanks and a bunch of Widow Mines. Marines, obviously, also not the preferred target. We do not yet have a Ghost Academy, so I think adding on additional tech labs here would be nice. But we really do need a Ghost Academy. Shin at this point maxed out, so he decides to commit. Is he gonna blow up the CC? It's expensive. Ay -ay -ay. All right. I don't know if I love that move, to be honest. It's not like he's got that much money in the bank. Oh my god. <laughs> so much value. Gumiho stimming the entire army, while in the meantime also unloading marines on the left side of the map to try and go after this newly finished hatch. It's just marines and metavex though. Alright. Well, I don't like this position that much anymore. For Shin. Metavex flying on over towards the bottom left hand corner. It will get denied by those corruptors eventually. The only problem I foresee right here for Gumi is that he does not have a Ghost Academy. And if Ultras suddenly hit the battlefield and he's not prepared and he only has Marine Tank, Ultras will chomp through that all day, every day. Big Ling Bane run by towards the bottom section of the map. This is that newly acquired fourth. No Planetary Fortress yet. SCVs are falling, but the base at the 12 o'clock position is also pushed away. Battlecruiser being used defensively. We need to get some repairs if we want to keep it alive. I think this is it. Our last battle cruiser does end up going down. Battle cruisers are now extinct. Yeah. Just like, well, dinosaurs and 99% of any organism that ever existed, I guess. It's a little sad, but. Big, big run bys here, though. Loads of damage being done by Shin. And suddenly, the Terran's door is wide open. We still have that massive army over here, but Ultras are coming. For some reason, we decided to build the Ultralisk Cavern out in the open, which is a little unfortunate. But I still think that Gumiho with eight workers is gonna have a very hard time killing even just the few Ultras that are available. So he's gonna have to do it though with this army that he's got right now. It's a powerful army, it's 117 supply worth of Terran. One Ultra apparently, unfortunately for it, spawned in up north. That is from that hatchery that, well only existed for a little while, but that is a load of Bane Links. We're up to 52 Bane Links. 69 Marines though, so that's quite... Wrong button. Nice! Not this. Not, not this button. No, no, no. Anyways, Bane Links rolling forward. Ultras will be able to get the rep around. And ultimately, this is way too much Zerg. And then a bit of a roller coaster of a Terran versus Zerg here. I, I do think it's ultimately gonna be Shin who obtains the victory. Or, as I could say it... Who obtains the victory? <laughs> GG. Game number two. We find ourselves on the map Oceanborn. Okay. Cool attempt right there by Gumi. And I do think there were opportunities for him, but... You need to grab them with both hands in that matchup. Honestly, it all went south when he first tried to take the third base. And those marines ended up getting surrounded, right? Like, that is when he was first put on the back foot. And the entire battlecruiser gamble kind of was flipped upside down at that point. And obviously, the game went on for like another 10 minutes or so, but... That is ultimately what 
yeah, started the advantage for Shin. I also think he was too greedy on the second battle cruiser. Like he could have teleported it back. Yeah, I think he could have. If he would have had both BCs alive for the majority of that game, it would have looked a whole lot better. Then suddenly the Zerkling runbys would be much easier to deal with because normally at that point the battle cruisers they will be yeah going from offense to clean up duty. That's essentially I guess the battle cruiser retirement plan, right? Like you deal some damage early on. You go back home, you get repaired. Maybe every once in a while you fly out, but you always teleport back home to safety. And ultimately, you're really good at cleaning up links and banes. Having a second battle cruiser right there, available for all these runbys, super handy. This time around, though, it's going to be a double barracks opener. Hatchery into a gas into a pool. So no shenanigans here with the 15 hatch from Shin. Which is, of course, by the way, in case you're unfamiliar, maybe you haven't followed the game that much, but this is Ragnarok's new username. Ragnarok actually just joined a new team that was uh, announced very recently. I don't even know the name of the team right now. He doesn't have a clan tag in this particular game, but... Congratulations to him. Quite a few StarCraft 2 uh, players have been picked up by big esports organizations as of late, which is really cool. Reapers. Anywhere between 2 to 5 is the standard. Normally it's 3. Yep. Sometimes Bjorn, when he goes for this opener, he will see that the opponent has not yet gone for a third base and cancels the third Reaper. Other Terran players don't really seem to do that all too much, but we can go all the way up to five. I think in this instance, though, where Ragnarok is, uh, or Shin Rotter is sitting back, just two bases. I don't think he really needs to be all too concerned with the third Reaper, but he is going to let it finish. It's a pretty small investment, right? It's a good unit overall. Careful, though. Queen is going to spawn. Oh, uh, greet, greet! Oh. Okay. Like, they heal up so quickly out of combat, but it's so easy to lose them as well. Luckily, they do have that rapid regeneration. Imagine if the Reapers were to give the Marines that rapid regeneration, right? Like, they clearly use, like, different locker rooms or something inside of those barracks. I don't know how it works, but... The Marines and the Marauders, they get Stimpex. They they clearly share a, a locker room, but I'm not exactly sure about the Reapers. They dance, they definitely have the fancy stuff. Triple CC on the back of this. Still no third hatchery anywhere. And this is starting to look kind of dicey here for Shindo. Like, yeah, he hasn't taken a ton of damage, and this is all pretty respectable, but there's also not a whole lot of follow-up. We have not been mining gas. Loses a queen here, I think? Oh, just barely not. Brenda lives. He tried going for a third base just now, but drone got the knight. The good old Reaper. Sometimes I see people requesting Reaper buffs because they are only ever used in the early game. <laughs> Every once in a while, I see like a, I don't know, like a Reddit thread or a forum post about people saying that they should really allow the Reaper to have Stimpak. <sighs> that would be very dangerous. We would probably never see anything but Reapers for at least a very long time. I don't think that would be a very good choice. There's a bunch of units in the game that are very delicately balanced, and I think the Reaper is one of them. If you make any improvement to the Reaper whatsoever, we're gonna see guys just make Reapers every single game. They also got nerfed so much. It's actually interesting to think back of some of the units and how much they've changed. The Reaper may be the unit that has gotten the most updates historically. Maybe the Infester, actually. I don't know. What is the most adjusted unit historically in the game? Like in the early days of Wings of Liberty, the Reapers had the requirement to have a tech lab on the barracks. And then inside of the tech lab on the barracks, there was a speed upgrade for the Reaper. But in order to get the speed upgrade, you needed to have a factory? <laughs> We've come a long way. They also threw grenades and all that. Like, they really have been adjusted a lot over the years. Void Rays have received a lot of updates too, I guess. They used to charge up. Yeah, there have been a bunch of units that really have gone through significant changes. 
And ultimately, this, the version that we settled on was the more simplistic approach. A lot of units had really cool abilities and all kinds of unique things that other units never had. And somehow, some way, all of those changes have been polished out over the years. Ravens have gotten a lot of updates. I guess Cyclones have received a lot of updates too. But the problem with Cyclones is that they weren't they weren't added to the game until much later on. But they have certainly received a lot of updates over the years though. Queens also got nerfed many, many times. Still the best Zerg unit. By a mile. Anyways, Stimpak is done. We had Medifex. I was gonna say, hello. Uh, you guys are supposed to be up north. Okay. Gumiho forgot the Medifex. But where we are going, we need no Medifex. I don't know if these Marines realize that they signed up for a one-way trip. But you know what? Maybe... He's actually still not sending them. That's kind of crazy. He's almost got four Medifex. This is so sad for those Marines. I did cast a Gumiho series too. A TVP. Where he was just throwing away marine after marine after marine, man. This is taking a page out of that very same book. There's no reason for those meta effects. <laughs> Dude, these guys get private planes. They have to share the plane with one other marine. It's a little messed up, but anyways. Ultimately, I guess everybody will join together and the marines do get to live for a little bit longer. Okay. Fourth hatchery now coming up on the left side of the map. Liberator here. Got one confirmed kill. This hatch is a little tricky for the Zerg player to secure because of this high ground area. You really want to try and get creep in that location. So far though, the only units that have died on the side of Terran, other than now apparently that uh, Liberator. At least up to uh, me starting that sentence, was the Reapers. But now suddenly... Shin gets a nice little counter-attack in. Reinforcing units are here, but they're sleeping on the job. Trying their very best, I guess, to just keep all of this alive, but this is quite annoying. Uh, three SCVs is actually quite respectable in the end. Metavex goes straight into the opponent's main base. Just dedicated, apparently, to... Really? This is such a wild series so far. Like, the decisions here are all very questionable, but somehow we're making it work? There's no way we set out to try and kill the Hydralisk den of all things. Well, the Hydralisk den also did not fall. The Gumi got moving around. Banelings, though, in the meantime, on the other side, they're gonna finish the job that those Zorklings started. And they will not be getting any repairs, apparently. It's just gonna be the siege tank. Yeah, only the important people get repairs. Hatchery up north does get killed. And we're just gonna boost away again. Okay. I feel like I've been talking about Gumiho a lot. What exactly has Shin been up to? Well, Shin is not really creating a lot of opportunities for himself. Like, he's doing the classic thing that Zerg players love to do, where they're sitting back and they're basically just absorbing every push. And then at some point, they plan on overwhelming the opponent. So she has had some successful runbys throughout this series so far, but that's really about it. I don't love the passive approach here overall, especially if the passive approach does not involve lurkers. I think that's probably the best way to do it. Gumiho, pulling all the way back. Plus two, plus two is... Not done yet for either player, but Gumiho is going to finish his like a full minute before the opponent. So those Marines, they're going to be quite a bit more powerful. He's not messing around with any Marauders, by the way. It's just Marine Medivac tank. Here's another Zorkling run by. Natural expansion's wide open. Oh no, don't tell me this is going to work. Okay. In the meantime, good pickups. Important to get on out of there. Quite a few SCVs, though. Yeah, are gonna end up falling over here. Not enough units in... Yeah, in time at the home right here for Gumi. He did not decide to send some of those units back. Honestly, some questionable decision here. Questionable decisions from both players. I'm not in love with it. 18 SCVs is a ton of losses, but this army... This army is still big. 
Yeah, the amount of units that Gumio has been able to muster up. He starts up 3-3? Dude, I think where we are going, 3-3 is never gonna finish. If the game lasts until your 3-3 is done, I think you're dead. I think you basically have to win with the army that you've got right now. Because the Zerk economy is still booming. Sure, you may have killed a hatchery or two. But I think you have to try and win the game with the units that you've got right now. 2-2 though is finishing right here for Shin and that's gonna make the game so much easier. Gumio has been ping-ponging back between the front lines and the home and, and yeah, he's ultimately gonna be forced to push onto creep. I don't know if he quite grasps the situation that he's in. He doesn't know about these bases on the right side. So maybe that is what's throwing him off a little bit, but... This is a scary army though. This is an awful lot of marines. We're up to 90 marines. Ooh, yoy, yoy. All right. Shin starts up a hive. Again, just like the 3-3 research, I think where we are going, a hive is not needed. If you clean up this army, I think you win the game, and with that, the series, and Shin decides to collapse on top of his unit composition, completely off creep. Ooh, some big misreads from both players. Ultimately, though, Gumia's army is 91 supply big versus, well, right now, 64 supply for Shin. Lovely pre-splitting, of course, by Gumiho, trying to bait all of that out. And you know what? 3-3, it is on the horizon. That is going to make those Marines significantly more powerful. Still trying to push, though, before he ever really gets to that point. Reinforcing Hydras of all units are showing up right now. Queens and Hydras, that is not a unit composition. Bailings were morphed in somewhere, but I think there might just be enough Marines to clear out all of these units. Look at the train of bio here, now moving across the map as well. This reminds me of that Bunny vs. Dark series. Whew, ultimately, Gumiho, with a last-ditch effort, he closes it out and he does win the game. Final game of this best of three series. We find ourselves on the map. El Cyane. Alright. Some interesting decisions from both players so far in this series. Gumiho with the good old rally attack. Loses most of his economy, drops the mules, and just, well, tries to afford as many marines as he possibly can. Shin, in the meantime, yeah, seems a little bit aimless, to be honest. Like, I think if you're gonna play a passive style, it can, of course, work. We see this all the time from players like, for example, Dark or Raynor or whoever, right? Like, they play passively, they absorb every attack, but then ultimately the plan is to, for example, send lurkers through the Nidus Worm. Shin is absorbing every attack. And then we just try to absorb more attacks. <laughs> I, I don't really love the ultra passive approach. He's obviously a very good Zerg, but I would like to have a bit more of a win condition rather than I'm gonna try and have my opponent make a mistake and then counter attack to win. Those run bys have been very good, but good luck trying to get those run bys done against somebody like, for example, Maru or for example, Clem. I think you'd be Finding it very difficult to get much damage done. Anyways. So far, nothing all too weird. Barracks over here on top of the high ground. Command center on the low ground. Gumiho is going to be sending an SCV scout across the map here eventually too. The idea behind this one is just to make sure that that Reaper is safe to go across. So this, this generally speaking, is only going to see the creep. So you could just send it right over here and then send it straight back home. Just knowing that the Reaper is safe to go across is really the only information you're hoping for. This is a very quick command center, by the way. So it's CC first. Normally the Reaper would pop right now. Yeah, it's a hatchery first. So nothing all too weird. Two drones pulled out of gas. And we should be able to go for 100 gas here eventually. He's actually going to keep the SCV around for a little bit longer just to see if the third base is going to be taken over here. That is what the original plan was. Shin moved the drone over to the left side for just a moment, but super greedy here, actually. Okay. Yeah, it's just a Marine, so we don't even really have that much. But ultimately, Shin is going to make the assumption that there will be a Reaper coming across the map momentarily, so he's not actually sending his Zerklings out. Obviously, without speed, not much you can do without the links. 
But I can say purely marine based opener, you could get a little bit more adventurous. Third command center coming up right now. Nice and early. Should probably complete the wall here. Or over there. That also works. We're gonna go for a reactor, but a single Hellion here first and foremost. Should be a, a starport as well. There's the starport SCV. We'll have to see if it's gonna be a tech lab here on the back of this too. I think overall, triple CC Hellion Benchy is probably the best build you can play as Terran. It's just so solid. Assuming you micro well, you can stay alive against practically everything. Just a little box. Has this box always been here on the map? I must have seen hundreds of games on this map. I've never noticed a box. <laughs> there have been boxes on the low ground over here. Is this a, yeah, StarCraft 2 loot box? You may get a new Marauder skin? Ah, dang it, play, playing Zerk. Ah, oh, hate it whenever you get a Marauder skin and you're playing Zerk. I've never noticed a box. All right, safety Zerklings right here for Shin. He's trying to scout and see what's going on. And this, by the way, gonna be Heli and Benshi. Second tech lab coming up right now here for the Gumi God. So he will be going into good old bio. At least he should be. Double tech lab without that would be really weird. All right. Two additional gases taken on the low ground right now as well for Gumi. And that'll allow him to do whatever he likes. Third command center is done. So he doesn't really need to deal any damage, but dealing some sort of damage is sweet. Shin may be thinking about taking the golden minerals as his fourth base, although it's become pretty it's become pretty popular to actually take this base over here. Oh what? Really? Factories are coming. So Gumi is playing full on Terran mech? Huh, interesting. I really expected we were gonna see a tech lab on the, the, the barracks and that we were gonna go into the Stimpak research, but Gumi is going into Terran Mech, focusing on a Raven. Terran players have not really figured out Ravens in this matchup. They love playing them against Terran. They love playing them as well from time to time, of course, against Protoss. Against Zork, we don't really see a lot of Ravens, but I've been molding a little bit about this particular unit, especially in the late game. According to Raynor, the reason why Terrans don't mix in Ravens in the late game is because it messes with their old army hotkey. I don't know how true that is. <laughs> but maybe? Double armory on the back of this right here from Gumi. Cyclones these days do benefit from the attacking upgrades. That is one of the changes that they made to the unit. Back in the day, that lock-on ability, which is where most of their damage comes from. Only, well, it was considered a spell, so don't, the unit really only benefited from armor upgrades, but you can get some value out of the attacking upgrade right now, too. So it's going to be the new upgrade, the Hurricane Thrusters, together with 1-1 one, one upgrades and just mass Cyclone. If Shin is paying attention, a nice guy Gumiho is parking his units within vision range right there. If Shin is paying attention, he should see exactly what is going on in this game. So he should not be playing... Okay, well, he has seen it now. I was gonna say, he should not be focusing too much on Ling Bane. Roach Warren is coming, though, so he knows that he needs something. And we're also gonna go into an infestation pit. Be it for Hive Tech or be it for Infestors. Both are good options, but you do need something against this particular army. Fungal Growth can be very, very nice. So if you manage to get the Fungal Growth on a bunch of Cyclones, and then you can close the distance with Ling Bane Roach. Very nice way of doing it, but look at this Raven. You don't even need the Raven against Burrowed Infestors, okay? You can even use it to clear out a bunch of creep. I know. Anti-armor missile? Oof. Beautiful. I'll shut up about the Ravens now, but I really think in like a year or two, we're gonna see Ravens every late game of TVZ. It just seems like a no-brainer to me, but... Apparently not. Not right now, anyways. Well, in this game, we have one pretty early. Okay, that hatchery, it is gonna get cancelled. Bane speed at this point is done. Yeah, good old Hellbats here though. Blue Flame Hellbats are gonna be coming here momentarily. The Infernal Pre-Igniter upgrade is coming up. I don't know if Gumi is really planning on adding on even more Hellions at this point. He's really just massing Cyclones. 
But you know what? If you have a bunch of Hellions left over from earlier, you may as well. Okay, now we have a plan. Look at that. Nidus Network coming up. Overlord already at the bottom of the map. Shin wants to, ooh, try and make use of some of this Terran immobility. He is going Swarm Host against a Cyclone build. I don't know if I love that. Generally, you could play Swarm Host against every Terran mech unit composition except Battle Mech. Now, that is in the previous patch. Battle Mech hasn't been super popular as of late. Maybe against this version of Battle Mech, the Swarm Host are useful? I'm just a little afraid that every time the, the, the Locusts decide to go up into the air, well, either the Cyclones just kill them or they just run away. All right, anyways. Nidus Worm is gonna come up over here and the Locusts will probably be flying on over towards that base. Blue Flame Hellbat dropped, by the way. May as well, we had a Medivac, we had some Hellbats. Zorkling counterattack, cancel. Cancel and lift, cancel and lift. Oh my God, okay. Apparently we did have a... <laughs> Hold up, what? How did that Raven end up with an anti-armor missile on itself? Hello, so this is wild at... Ah, that's how. We decided to shoot it at our feet. You know what, maybe that old army hotkey theory may not be so far off. Um, that base is actually, unless we're gonna be able to drop a mule, it might just still burn down. Zerkling and Locust counterattacks here. Oh no, oh no. Please send an SCV. Please drop a mule, do whatever. Hello. Oh no, oh no. Oh god, Oh. <laughs> oh you made it worse. <sighs> this particular series is definitely high level, but there are a bunch of like, you know, gold league moments. <laughs> Where I'm just sitting here with my hands in my hair. I don't have my camera on. Maybe I should cast this series with my camera on. There have been a bunch of moments here where I am just... <sighs> we had like half a minute to do that. And I understand there were loads of things going on, but... Alright, this is also one of the positions to put down a Knight as Worm. Okay. Ultimately, though, Gumiho is still in a position where he has a solid economy. Like, he's got loads of command centers. Apparently, we're feeling confident to just build one over here. Usually, right? At least historically. Actually, hold that thought. I guess the Banelings are moving forward. Nah, this is gonna get pushed back for sure. There's so much Terran here. Yeah, no way. Hello? Swarm host? Get back in the worm! Historically, against Swarm host, the one thing you're trying to avoid is the Terran player maxing out. Preferably, they never get up to like 100 army supply. At this point, well, Terran is already at 100 army supply. At least when these units spawn. There we go. Plus three, plus three is coming up for the Terran mech player. I actually... <laughs> I actually don't think that playing Swarm Host against Battle Mech is a particularly strong choice strategically. Even though it's sort of worked out right here for Shin. It requires a bunch of luck. Oh, look at that. The two lads over here did finish the job. Okay. Alright, if Gumiho manages to max out with 3-3 Terran mech, I think he should feel really good about himself. Adding on additional command center after command center 2. Bit early for those, I would not have minded seeing him just max out first, but I guess he's just making so many cyclones. He's just building cyclones, by the way. Like, he's got a, a Banshee too, fair enough. Oh! Please be for mass battle cruiser transitions. That would make me very happy. It could just be for something boring, like Mass Liberator. Probably also something much better. Uh, okay, there was one Siege Tank. So Gumiho is spending like his money is never gonna run out, but he doesn't have that much money. Like this is like getting a credit card in the mail and thinking that the $5,000 limit is the amount of money you should go ahead and spend right now. Like Gumi, you, you don't... You don't, like, you're gonna have to pay for it at some point. There is the fusion core. Never mind, get that credit card, Gumi. Keep it going, dude. Um. 
I mean, if you can't pay it off, just get another credit card and then, you know, do, do that. Just make the battle cruises. That's all I'm asking for, Gumi. I'm not really asking for much. You can get more free money. <laughs> um, so there's the Fusion Core finishing. The only downside here to fellow battle cruiser enjoyers is that Gumiho is currently maxed out and he can't actually. Oh, there they go! Triple battle cruiser transition. I just want to emphasize here that Shin is still like at a like tier 1.5. Levels of tech. He's going into Vipers right now together with Hydralisks. Now, in case you're unfamiliar, Hydras absolutely get destroyed by Terran Mech in general, um, but especially by Battle Cruisers. Now, these are unupgraded Battle Cruisers, I guess. Going up against 2 2 Hydras. I mean, he doesn't even need them, it looks like. He might just be able to win the game with this particular push. Shin, don't leave yet. Oh my god. We're all army hot king the vipers in? Oh. Good guy Shin does decide to stay in the game. For all of the battle cruiser connoisseurs watching this, I think they will indeed be able to join in the battlefield and make some use of themselves. Plus one air weapons coming up after the 3-3 is finished for the cyclones. Uh, when I see Cyclones being played like this, though, right? Like, this doesn't quite look like the perfect Cyclone game by any stretch of the imagination. And they're already really good. It seems like Battle Mech is really strong. Other than against, like... Serral? <laughs> yeah, that's probably about it, really. We rarely see it being played, but it would be nice if it was a little bit more common. I feel like there needs to be a Terran player out there that shows other Terran players the way, you know? StarCraft players are not necessarily very creative. Gumiho is one of them, of course, but... A lot of Terran players, a lot of StarCraft players in general, will just copy whatever other players are doing. Anyways, the Battlecruiser hit squad moving on the right. Gumiho may just be the battle mech savior. Those Swarmos are still trying to get some work done. They have been quite good, but now suddenly the Battle Cruisers show up. Um, Hydras are available. Hydras, of course, are complete glass cannons. Oh, they didn't even get the Siege Tank. Hydras, in the meantime, are struggling against... Well, Siege Tank's over here, and then a bunch of Cyclones, too. In the meantime, Battle Cruisers hitting whatever structure they can. Advanced Ballistics on the back of this too, by the way, here for Gumi. Don't tell me, by the way, that one of the... Yep, yeah, one of the Battle Cruisers died to the Queens. Anyways. There is no counter. Like, we have Hydralisks, but other than that, there is no counter against Battle Cruisers. And there is, of course, a chance that the Hydras can clear the job. I actually think you kind of want to go Microbial Shroud now, but... In the meantime, the leftover Cyclones on the other side will be able to kill the base. Battlecruiser's still going to town as well against that mineral line, and this is now a super chaotic game. Keep in mind, though, that the Battlecruisers can teleport back home at any moment, and we have four more just about to spawn. So we're gonna go up to eight BCs. Eight BCs against 20-something Hydras. I don't think that's gonna be an easy task for the Hydralisks. I mean, even the SCVs are a pretty tricky task for the Hydralisks, it looks like. Terran reinforcements idling on the ramp. The battle cruises on the other side of the map have not been dealt with whatsoever. Shin's economy is completely gone. He decided to, yeah, go for a Spire there in the end, but he was never going to be able to produce enough Corruptors to shut down the BCs. And it's Gumiho, our Mech Terran, who obtains the victory.